I actually think it's one of the hardest things of your partner dying is being a single parent because, I mean, everything is doubled. So you are emotionally distraught. You are grieving the death of your partner. You probably aren't sleeping very well. You may have masses of worries about what life going forward. You have to earn the income for two when there's one and you're taking care of the children. And as we've kind of talked about before, you are the, the, the outcome of your children is predicted by how you grieve and how you parent. So there's an enormous psychological pressure for you to kind of not do it right, but to be OK. And you may not be OK at all. I mean, particularly if it's a suicide or, a, you know, a terrible traumatic death. But even if it's some, not even, but when it's someone who's maybe been ill for six months and then died and you're, and you've got children together, it is, I think the thing that I pick up most from those families that I see is the relentlessness of it, yeah. the exhaustion, the relentlessness, the worry, the fear, and like not being enough, like you already feel like you're under the cosh emotionally, that like you have very little, and then you know, something goes wrong. Like I, I had a client the other day who, whose car got nicked. And it was like, you know, that is just the thing that was too much. It's like the world is against me. You know, my, my partner has died. My children are homeschooling. I'm trying to keep a job. And then my bloody car got nicked. You know, it's those things which are annoying for all of us. But for, I think if you're a single parent, feel utterly devastating. It's a sort of pile up, I think, because you have the emotional difficulty and then you have the practical difficulty. And, you know, couples naturally divide themselves in terms of what they do in a household. And suddenly it's like you have to take roles that aren't your normal, natural roles and get used to those whilst grieving. And, whilst, and your children are grieving. And whilst supporting your children whilst grieving. And I mean, are there any sort of tips you would give about that? I know you've said things like, you know, trying to keep to structures is always very good. Is, you know, what are some of your sort of top tips? <laughs> I think is make sure that you have a network of people that you can call on. And you know, I think we're all very reluctant to do that. But so I worked with a woman and I, she kind of, who, whose husband died very suddenly. And she, she got six people and three of them were men. She had two sons and they she kind of put in the diary that they played football, they went to matches, they went to movies, they took them out for a hamburger, so that she introduced male, um, they because they really missed the physical presence of their dad. And of course they missed him, but also a male presence. Um, and so I think you really need your network as much as you can and make it very concrete, like things that they can do, things that can support you. And as a family, I think you have to sit around the kitchen table and talk to each other about what's difficult. And that when you've lost it because, you know, you they've finished the milk and it's eight o'clock and, and you lose your rag, you just have to kind of later say, I'm really sorry, I lost my rag. You know, I think you name what's going on. What frightens children is the, is the unknown. So if you're unpredictable, they're looking at you frightened, like, are you going to lose it? or are you gonna be the reliable, nice parent? And so I think if you can say to them, you know, I am gonna lose it now and again, and I, I never want to be this person, but this is who I find myself to be because I'm missing mommy or daddy so much. So kind of name what's going on. Um, treat to, I mean, we've talked about this before, children need the same truth as all the adults around them yeah. and check what their understanding of the truth is. And children need, you know, to be able to grieve, to jump in and out of puddles, to be really sad and to be absolutely fine, happy children. And what they need most is, is when their comfort is not to be told, don't cry, but to be sad with you, sit on your lap, yeah. have cozy times watching movies with hot chocolate, with, you know, do things that, that soothe you and calm you. I love what you say about giving things names and articulating what you feel, because, you know, it's not... That of course everyone's going to be upset, but if you can say what you're feeling, then that can be a shared intimacy and bring mm -hmm. a kind of closeness. And it's also sort of teaching your children not how to have perfect, happy lives, 
but when we hit a storm, this is how we weather it together and this is how we share our experiences. So I think, you know, again, not trying to stay calm, but kind of including them in what's happening to you. And the big thing is that when you've had a rupture, when you've been a storm, is the repair. It's never the fight. It's the acknowledgement. I'm sorry I lost it. I behave badly. I feel bad. I'm really sorry. Tell me what you're feeling. What are you angry with me about? Let them name what they're upset about. Try and do a deal. Like, I'm going to try not to do this, this, this. What's the worst thing I did? Let them tell you what's the worst thing I did. Okay, I'm going to work. take the feedback. I'm going to work hard in not doing that. So don't fix it too soon. You have to let them be cross with you. You have to let them say what they're cross about because when they've articulated, it makes sense for them. And then you can have the hug. But I think people often want to go in and tell them not to be cross too soon because it's unbearable. But children need to be allowed to be cross with their mom and dad if their mom and dad or dad has behaved in a way that is is hurtful. 